step three of our five steps of hypothesis testing is to select a criterion for significance. Now pretend that you and I are watching the horses run, and I tell you that I have a new way of betting. Here's my strategy. I'm gonna wait until all the races have been run, and then, once I know the outcome, then I'm gonna place my bets. I think I have a much better chance of winning if I wait until I already know the outcome. But what do you think of my new strategy for betting? Would you take that bet? The one that I offer after I know the outcomes? That's not how betting works. And that is not how hypothesis testing works either. We have to place our bets before the horses run. We want to establish a level of significance a priori before we do any testing. We will state before we begin what evidence we are willing to accept that two means are statistically significantly different. What we don't want to do is collect massive amounts of data, and then run multiple hypothesis tests on our data, and then sort through the findings to identify the ones that are statistically significant, and report only those findings. And why would we not do that? Because when we establish a level of significance, we are also establishing an error rate. If we use a 95% confidence interval, then naturally, 5% of our statistically significant findings will be false positives. If we only do one test, well then our error rate is 5%. But if we do multiple tests, we are all but guaranteed that at least some of those significant findings are going to simply be there because of random chance. In a famous XKCD comic, an excited student announces that jelly beans cause acne but her skeptical friend wants to see the evidence. The overall findings were that jelly beans did not cause acne. But when they examined subgroups, something emerged. After testing 20 colors of jelly beans, 19 of them could not be said to cause acne, p greater than 0.05. But in one of the 20 findings, green jelly beans were significant, p less than 0.05. But remember that a 5% error rate implies that 1 in 20, 5% of those tests will be significant by random chance. However, that does not stop a gullible and statistically naive newspaper from reporting that green jelly beans cause acne, p less than 0.05. Running multiple tests and looking only for the statistically significant findings is called data mining, and it's not a good way to do science. What we want to do is establish before we run our tests exactly what our significance level will be. And that will minimize the chance that we get fooled by randomness. How do we place our bets? How do we determine a criterion for statistical significance? Well, for the most part, that decision is made for us. The most common level of significance used in scientific testing is 0.05, or 5%. However, there are three ways that we could interpret this value when we look at the output for our statistical testing. The first is a model of hypothesis testing in which we establish a critical value or cutoff score and only test values that exceed that predetermined cutoff score are statistically significant. For example, we may be looking for z-scores that are greater than 1.96. Or we look up a critical value of 2.048 in a t-table. If the t-test statistic is 3.66, it exceeds that cutoff score. A second way to establish statistical significance is by using probability values. This is a model of significance testing. Probability values provide evidence against the null hypothesis. Probabilities less than 0.05, or 5%, are routinely taken as evidence of statistical significance. The third way is to examine the 95% confidence interval to determine whether it contains a predetermined value from the null hypothesis. If the confidence interval does not contain that value, then the findings are significant. Well, you may be wondering, when and where and how do we choose one of these criterion for statistical significance? I'm going to explain all three of them to you. 
each with its own little story about how we would do the interpretation. And then I'm going to show you how essentially all three of them are going to give us the same answer. Now, let's apply what we've learned to our baby weight example. For step three, we have set our alpha to 0.05. We are using a two-tailed test. If this was a z-test, the critical value would be positive or negative 1.96. If we're using a t-test, the critical value would be slightly higher than this and determined from our t-table. When we have completed these first three steps of hypothesis testing, we are finally ready to run our statistics, which is what we're going to do in step four of this introduction to hypothesis testing. <music>